Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Brother John, and the church. Uh, there's never been a time that the police department hasn't called upon you to help us, uh, whether it be the death, a fire, or uh, a victim of a crime, or just a person that's on hard times. You've always been there for us, and I want to thank you for that. Also, I want to praise our mayor and our city council for the hard work that they do. I'm going to give a, just a brief uh, overlook of what I do, and I've got some stuff I want to hand out to you and how we as a community can help. Uh, first of all, what my duties are as your chief of police, I have oversight of the department's operation and the budget, I have oversight of our officers, I have oversight of uh, the patrol, the investigation, and other duties that are performed by officers production and development of departmental policies and regulations, the upkeep and updating of our departmental equipment such as patrol cars, firearms, communication equipment, and uniforms. Uh, this year we were able to update our firearms and our radio, so we're very appreciative of that. I attended events and council meetings to give reports on departmental conditions and other disclosed information that is vital uh, to the operation of our city. Now remember we have a population of 1,635 people in Salem. These are the stats that I have just part of them as of October the 1st. Our department has answered 1,653 calls for service. We've made 182 criminal arrests. We've uh, made 16 DWI arrests. We've worked 57 accidents and we've issued 151 citations. So we stay fairly busy with the uh, uh, short amount of manpower that we do have. We're, we're fortunate to live in a place to where we have a fairly low crime rate, but sometimes that increases it depends on who we have incarcerated at the time. It's a revolving door. Uh, property crimes and uh, drug crimes are what we deal with the most. Uh, as Daryl told you last week, the people they they steal to feed their addictions, uh, whether it's methamphetamine or prescription narcotics. The prescription narcotics are what we're seeing more of. We're becoming an opiate dependent society and it, it's sad. I grew up working in a drugstore uh, for my mother and a lot of these drugs were designed to treat terminal patients. They weren't designed for pain management but unfortunately that's the way it's become. Until our federal government steps in and helps us with this, we're going to be fighting a losing battle. These people that use these drugs, they will continue to feed their addictions until they're in one or two places, and this is a hard fact to swallow, but they're either going to end up in jail or they're going to end up in a funeral home. That's just the way it is, and there's nothing that I can do about it. The only way that I can see a change is to break the cycle. A lot of these children that we have today, they grow up in an environment to where it becomes normal to them. They're not as fortunate as a lot of us are here today. As parents, uh, it, it has to start at home. Now listen to me when I tell you this. Monitor your kids at all times. This social media thing is just unbelievable. I don't do it, I don't like it, my family and kids will tell you that I, I call it the devil. It can be good and bad, but most of the time, it, it's, from my perspective, it turns out to be bad. However, it has started to where I've solved some crimes using it. There are apps out there where these kids, they can hide things, such as alcohol, drug abuse, or even pornographic material. It may look like a calculator. There are several uh, websites, uh, one in particular, the Attorney General's website, it can help you to understand how the kids can hide this stuff. Uh, I promise you that they're going to be exposed to it at some point in time. Don't, don't be the parent that says, my kid wouldn't do that. They're human beings and the temptation will always be there. Let me, uh, I need a volunteer from each section.
a little different from up here. I always wondered what was hidden back here. If they're passing those out, I'll go ahead and get started. I wanted you to have something tangible that you can take home and hopefully you can help. Currently there's 32 kids from Fulton County that are in foster care and there's only six foster families to accommodate them. So a lot of these kids, are, they're scattered across the state and I'm just gonna go over the brief uh, overview of each section and that way you can decide where uh, you can help. Some of the areas that, that are in need uh, is to sponsor a child for Christmas, provide a dinner for a foster family, provide child care for a foster family so they have a break, be a mentor to one of these kids, provide snacks or drinks, provide school supplies. A lot of these kids because of our limited amount of families that can help, they're, they're shipped out all across the state and a lot of the schools don't provide supplies like our school does. Volunteer transportation, being involved with a support group or a leader. Uh, the contact information is on the paperwork I give you. I don't know if it's on the front or back, but it is on there. And so I encourage each of you to participate if it's all possible. I know you've probably heard this before because I've said it many, many times. Law enforcement is only good as those we serve. I'm gonna say that again. Law enforcement is only as good as those we serve. And what I mean by that is you know your, na your neighborhoods better than I do. If something is out of place, report it to us. Let us check it. It may or may not be anything uh, to it at all. So always be aware of your surroundings. I have an open door policy so anybody that wants to come and visit with me uh, I'll be more than happy to visit with you. Uh, in closing first let me thank you for allowing me to speak to you today and uh, we're going to play a short uh, audio recording. It's the late Paul Harbin and he better describes what a police officer is. So thank you. A policeman is a composite of what all men are, I guess, a mingling of saint and sinner, dust and deity. Called statistics, wave the fan over stinkers, underscore instances of dishonesty and brutality because they are news. What that really means is that they are exceptional, they are unusual, they are not commonplace. Buried under the froth is the fact. And the fact is that less than one half of one percent of policemen misfit that uniform. And that is a better average than you'd find among clergymen. What is a policeman? He of all men is at once the most needed and the most wanted. A strangely nameless creature who is sir to his face and pig or worse behind his back. He must be such a diplomat that he can settle differences between individuals so that each will think he won, but if a policeman is neat, he's conceited. If he's careless, he's a bum. If he's pleasant, he's a flirt. If he's not, he's a grouch. He must make instant decisions which would require months for a lawyer, but if he hurries, he's careless. If he's deliberate, he's lazy. He must be first to an accident, infallible with a diagnosis. He must be able to start breathing, stop bleeding, tie splints, and above all, be sure the victim goes home without a limp or expect to be sued. The police officer must know every gun, draw on the run, and hit where it doesn't hurt. He must be able to whip two men twice his size and half his age without damaging his uniform and without being brutal. If you hit him, he's a coward. If he hits you, he's a bully. A policeman must know everything and not tell. He must know where all of the sin is and not partake. The policeman from a single human hair must be able to describe the crime, the weapon, the criminal, and tell you where the criminal is hiding. But if he catches the criminal, he's lucky. If he doesn't, he's a dunce. If he gets promoted, he has political pull. If he doesn't, he's a dullard. 
The policeman must chase bum leads to a dead end, stake out ten nights to tag one witness who saw it happen but refuses to remember. He runs files and writes reports until his eyes ache to build a case against some felon who will get dealed out by a shameless Seamus or an honorable who isn't honorable. The policeman must be a minister, a social worker, a diplomat, a tough guy, and a gentleman. And, of course, he'll have to be a genius because he'll have to feed a family on a policeman's salary. I want to thank you, Shad, for the presentation and also the handout. I think that there's many things that we can partner with our city police to do to better our community and to make a difference eternally in the lives of young people and others as well. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to uh, turn to the 23rd Psalm. We're going to start by reading verse number 4. I would ask you to stand, if you would, with me, and we'll read this psalm, and then we will we'll begin. You know the psalm quite well, and I have selected this particular verse because of the shepherding nature. It simply says in verse number 4 of chapter 23. David says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Here's the reason, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let us pray. Father, I do pray for guidance, wisdom, and encouragement for this community. I pray, Father, that we might make a, a long-term eternal difference. And, Lord, we might know our neighbors better, and we might know uh, our community better, and we might establish the type of community that you desire us to have. Help us, Lord, to not be part of the problem, but be part of the solution. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, everybody likes to be encouraged, and everybody likes to be thanked. Everybody likes to know that they're doing a good job. And sometimes we need to let people know that they're doing a good job. And our city police are no different. They need to be thanked. They need to be encouraged. There's a number of ways we can do that, and I think it's very important that we do that. Uh, we need to do that maybe by writing them a letter. If, if, if the city police has served you in a capacity and helped you, write them a letter of thanks. They get enough of the other stuff, trust me. And they get enough discouraging things. It would be nice to have something that would be encouraging for them. I always wave at every police officer. Uh, sometimes I wonder when I wave, I wonder, I bet, they, bet they're thinking I'm doing something wrong. You know, but I, but I, I wave at every police officer. And, and the reason I do that is I, I, I like to be waved at as well. I think we should speak uplifting words of appreciation to one another. Here's, a, here's something I would ask you to do. Next time you're in a restaurant and the police officer's there, just get his ticket, pay for his meal, don't let them know you did it, and just go on. But the greatest thing that we can do for our city police is pray for them. We need to pray for them. You know, when David was talking about, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and yet I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they protect me, they comfort me. I want you to, to know that this message today is really threefold. It's to protect to serve and to make peace. And I downloaded this and printed it off. It's the Law Enforcement Oath of Honor. And I want to read that to you. It says, On my honor, I will never betray my badge, my integrity, my character, or the public trust. I will always have the courage to hold myself and others accountable for our actions. I will always uphold the Constitution, my community, and the agency I serve. That is the International Association of Chief of Police Officers. Now, I think that's very important that we do that as well. We should hold each other accountable. We should live by integrity. We should live with honesty and dignity. Now, when I read the words of King David as he's speaking here, I think of a shepherd protecting the sheep. I think of, of the guidance and, and the love and the gentleness that is there. You know, in verse 4, it's talking about one of the most difficult circumstances in life. It's talking about going through a valley. And this valley was very deep, very dark. It was prone to flood. It was prone to have wild animals or it was also prone to have 
thieves that would, that would lodge there to, to steal the sheep and maybe even kill the shepherd. But the shepherd was always aware of what was going on and was on guard to protect the sheep and provide for their very needs. And here's the key. Do you know what the shepherd was doing? He was leading the sheep to a better place. And you know what? If we are law-abiding citizens, we get led to a better place. Now, that's twofold. That works on the side of the police officer, and it also works on the side of the civilian. We have to work hand-in-hand, tandem, to create this type of environment that God gives us. In fact, someone asked me just before service, said, tell me about the Old Testament. And I said, well, I can tell you about the Old Testament in basically one word, law. Law. You abide by the law. The New Testament is grace. And because of law and grace, we're blessed. And the law of God is do this, do this, and do this. But the problem is we are all law breakers. Every single one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. That's why he has given grace. And that's why sometimes when you get stopped by a police officer, they give you grace. They don't issue a ticket to you. They say, here's a warning. You get off. You get out of jail free card. But you know, it's the responsibility of our city police to protect us and to serve us. But the responsibility is for you and I to honor the law and to honor those who are executing justice as Charles read out of Romans. And there, there's a problem though. This equation breaks down. When both of us aren't working together. So let me just break this down into three thoughts. Number one is to serve. The law enforcement is to serve. That's the first standard that they have. In Matthew chapter 28, or chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus came from heaven to earth to do one thing. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and then to give his life a ransom for many. That's why Christ came. He came to serve us. Now, this is broken down in two different ways here. As I select that scripture and look within that, first off, it's a wholehearted commitment Jesus had to serve the heavenly Father to serve God. Now I want you to understand, just as, as the Son came to serve, He wanted to serve the Father, number one, because the Father said, who will go? Jesus said, I will go. Listen, here's one thing I want you to be aware of. Every single city police officer and staff and city council, guess what? They are all believers in Jesus Christ. They are all Christians. For that we should give a rousing praise the Lord. Amen. We are blessed by that. Now, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul laid out something for us. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You say, why would you use that passage, John? Because a shepherd's number one commitment was to serve the sheep, and, or excuse me, to serve God. And as he was serving God, he was shepherding as God called him to shepherd. And the life of a shepherd was never easy. It was long hours. You work day, you work night, you went after the wandering sheep. And uh, you know what? I understand that because as a pastor, sometimes you work long hours and you have to go after the sheep. That's my calling is to serve. And that's the same calling of the city police. They are first and foremost to serve. But here's the greatest thing of all. Our first responsibility is to serve God with all of our heart. Now, I thank God for our city police. The second thing I want you to understand is not only... Are they to serve God, a wholehearted commitment to serve God, but also this commitment to serve the sheep or the community. Did you notice the second thing that Jesus says in that text? He said that we are to serve others. We're to serve men and women. We are to serve. Now, he loved us so much that he gave the ideal example in John chapter 3 verse 16 when it says those famous words that everyone knows for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's an incredible love and that is the love that the shepherd has 
for the sheep. In the same way, as a shepherd has that responsibility for the sheep, it's my responsibility to do the same for you. And I want you to understand, when I preach a hard message, the reason I preach that hard message is not so I can just be vindictive and try to hurt you and whip you. It is because we have to preach the whole counsel of God. God calls us to preach everything from Genesis to Revelation and all in between. Thankful. I am so thankful that our city police love the Lord and serve us. The second thing I want you to hear is they protect. It's to protect. In John's gospel in chapter 10, this passage about the shepherd motif, it said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You know, to be a good shepherd is not just being a shepherd because there are a lot of shepherds out there. There's, there's a vast difference between uh, someone that is a shepherd and someone that is a good shepherd. Jesus was comforting as the good shepherd. But the good shepherd idea is this. The word good there is unique. It means to be intentionally good. It also means to be fair. So it means to be intentionally good and fair. And as a police officer, guess what? You're to be intentionally good and you're also to be fair. You're to be fair with all peoples. Not just those peoples that, that, that are like you, but all people. And as a pastor, the same way, we shepherd. We shepherd all people, not just those that are like us, but all people. And we have to be fair, and we have to be intentionally good. That's what the good shepherd does. Let me show you what two things I want to share with you here. It, it, we see this in this motif. The good shepherd, number one, is willing to die for the sheep. Now, listen. That, that's, a, that's a terrible thought, but in verses 11 through 13, I want you to see this. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And Jesus said, but the hireling, a hireling who, he, who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. Now, Jesus, of course, is the supreme model of, of the good shepherd. And the cross is the place that he went to. And he died. He gave up his life for the sheep. But I was thinking about that. And I thought about Googling something. And I did. And it's called the Officers Down Memorial Page. If you ever just want to have a sobering moment, Google that. Officers nationwide lost their life. You know how the majority lost their life? Gunfire. Very, very sad. Many of those deaths were in the line of duty, as I read through that. And many of those deaths in the line of duty were protecting citizens like you and I. Now, I don't know about you, but I could never be a police officer. I couldn't. Now, uh, uh, something my stepfather used to say all the time, and I finally understood what it meant a little bit later. He said, I have a strong heart, but my feet won't stand. So in the midst of, of, a, of a battle or a trial or a difficulty, I might have the urge to flee when I should stand. But you know what? It takes a special type of human being to stand in adversity. I don't know... I was looking up in the domestic abuse today, and there's so much domestic abuse. 3.5 million cases of domestic abuse in America last year. Staggering. That's all that's reported. That's, that's not all the domestic abuse cases. But do you know what I found when I read those? That most of the time when an officer responded, guess who ended up losing? Not the husband and not the wife, but it's the officer trying to protect. I'm telling you, I couldn't do that. The shepherd is willing to die for the sheep, for the people. But the second thing about this concept of protect is the shepherd has to know the sheep and the people. Now, I want you to see the passage of Scripture in John chapter 10, also in verses number 14 and 15. It said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. 
Shed, I could, I could ask you, do you know most of the people in the city? And you would say, yes. I know my sheep. I am known by them. And most of them know you, good or bad, right? As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And, and Jesus is saying, listen, you have to know your sheep if you're going to take care of your sheep. And if you don't know the people, you can't take care of the people, especially in a small city of 1,640 some odd, I believe Shad said. An officer, a county officer, but a city officer even more so, knows the nature and the names of the people. You do. You, can, you, you know the cars, you know the locations, you know where they live, you know where they go, you know the things that they do. Now just as a shepherd has uh, difficult sheep, so does a pastor have difficult sheep, and so does a police officer have difficult sheep. So what we have to do is not hate the sheep. It's to lovingly correct the sheep. Not to abuse the sheep. You see, a shepherd, when a sheep would, would wander away time and time again, and the shepherd would return them to the fold. But finally, after a point of, in time when the shepherd recognized the fact that the sheep was doing harm to itself. Do you know what the, sheep would, the shepherd would do to the sheep? He would take that sheep and wander it away and lovingly break its leg. You say, lovingly break its leg? What in the world do you mean? Lovingly break its leg so it couldn't go. And then what the sheep would do is put it around his shoulders and he would carry that sheep. That shepherd would carry that sheep everywhere he went. And what took place in that was a bonding between the sheep and the shepherd. And the sheep then would never wander away again. Now God desires us not to have our legs lovingly broken. But you know why we have jails? Because we have offenders. Do you know why we need officers? I wish we didn't. I wish we didn't need police. I wish everyone could go without a locked door and just leave their doors unlocked. I wish nobody had to take the keys out of the car. I wish we could leave money lying out and it would never walk away. I wished that were the case. But the fact of the matter is, it's not. And because it's not, we need one another. Sheep don't always live by the rules. There's a third thing I added to uh, the responsibility of the officer, and that is to make peace. To serve and protect, but then thirdly, I think it's to make peace. And that, that's not listed there, but in Romans 14, 19, I want you to hear this. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace. He's talking to the Roman church, but it can be applied to us. And the things by which one may edify another. How we may build up one another. And that builds and develops community. As Paul is speaking to the Roman church there, we can take that template and put it over our community and say that we need to serve, we need to protect, and then we need to make peace. We need peace in our community if it's going to thrive. We need peace. We need peace. Uh, you know, the few times in our community when I have seen the community at war, it's been horrible. I wasn't here, but there was a time in our community when the school system was divided and the community was divided. The people I talked to tell me it was a horrible time. And I'm going to tell you, when the community is not united, but the community is divided, it causes horrible problems. I want our community to be at peace. And the reason I want that is so we can thrive, we can be safe, and we can be a godly community, and we can be transformational in what we are doing. Listen, the community, the church, the ball teams, you know what? They all have something in common. And if they're going to be successful, if they're going to be winners, if they're going to be effective, I love what John Wooden former coach of UCLA, deceased now, when asked this question, what does it take to make a winning team? Here's what he said, three things. He said, first off, get the players in condition. You've got to get the players in condition. You know what I see, that in the community and the church? You have to provide an environment for everyone to thrive. 
You have to provide that environment. You have to keep the community neat and clean. Listen, we need our community to be pristine. Get the players in condition. The second thing that John Wooden said is teach them the fundamentals of the game. You know what that is? First off, you need to know the rules. You have to know the rules. You have to play by the rules. And you need to know the basics. You know what the basics are? If you don't have the basics down, you're not going to be victorious. You watch a football team. You know why Arkansas won the game last night? Because they had a few better fundamentals. They possessed the ball longer. They sustained drives longer. That's how you win. You see, unity. We work together. The third thing that John Wooden said I think is very important was this. Teach them to play together as a team. And that means unity. That means everybody is working together for the common good. And because together we are a team. And if we're going to win, if we're going to be victorious, we have to work together. And that's how a church works together. That's how a community works together. That's how we all work together. And I don't know about you, but I like to win. I don't want people when they come to Salem to say, what a trashy, ran down, horrible, godless community. I want them to say, wow, what are they doing that's different from us? How can we be that? I don't know about you. I, I used to love to read the comics when we would get the, uh, the paper at uh, my grandparents' house. We would always fight over the paper, but back then it wasn't the, it wasn't the editorial section, it wasn't the news section, it wasn't the sports section. It wasn't the Arkansas page. It was the comics. We fought to see who would get the comics first. And as a kid, I loved to read the comics. And Peanuts, Peanuts was a favorite character of mine. And I remember one strip, one comic strip that I read. Uh, Lucy comes into a room, and there's Linus lying down watching television. And she says, change the channel. And Linus responds, why should I? And Lucy holds up her hand and makes a fist and she said I'll give you five good reasons to change the channel well as she curled those fingers into a fist she said apart they're not much but when they are together they are powerful and awesome to behold Linus responded what channel do you want but then I like the next caption best of all because Linus is looking at his hand and he says, why can't you guys ever get together? <laughs> and I think of that for our community. Why can't you guys get together? Because we are so much more powerful together than we are apart. And you see, there's so much division in our community, in our nation. I want to see us work together. I want to see transformation. I want to see that our community becomes something that's just totally unique. You say, Pastor, that's just not possible. Because we're so different. I mean, spiritually we're different. Relationally we're different. Economically we are different. Socially, we are different. We are different in so many ways. Well, you know, I really believe that most of our differences are incidental, not fundamental. And if we can set aside those, I think we can be something really special. And you know what? I think that's what would please the Lord. Because all honor and authority and praise and glory would go to him. I want our community to be something incredibly special. And I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And I think it starts at church. Because our faith is the basis of everything good. And then it works out from there. I thank God that we have our officers, the city, are Christian men 
Thank God that our, that our council members are Christian men and women. I thank God for that. Doesn't mean they're perfect. And neither are we. Neither am I. But together we can put aside our differences and make a difference. How does it start? It starts right here. By giving our heart to Christ. By saying, Lord, you're going to have to be the boss. You're going to have to be Lord. And I'll submit. And I'll follow you. Today, would you do that? If you need to come and join this local assembly, would you do that? Start today. Let's be what God has called us to be. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just transform our church, our community, and make us what you have called us to be. And Lord, apart from you, we can do nothing. But greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. So because of you in us, we can make an eternal difference. Lord, may thy will be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand and would you come? You've been waiting to come. This is your opportunity the today. The cross upon which Jesus died Is a shelter in which we can hide And it's grace so free is sufficient for me and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you though millions have come there's still room for one yes there's room at the cross for you all right listen you be the difference maker don't expect the community to do it don't expect our police department to do it you do it you be the one who affects change you be the one Listen, we can make a difference. But if we don't start and if we don't come to serve and our officers don't protect and we don't unify for peace, it'll never happen in Salem, Arkansas. But I believe it can. Because good always wins over evil. Amen. Not just in the Westerns, but in reality. All right. Uh, Josh Smithy dismisses.